My name is Gary Mack, G-A-R-Y-M-A-C-K. I'm the curator at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. I live in Arlington, Texas, as of a couple weeks ago. My first recollection of Gary goes back to a pamphlet he produced that, in fact, he had me in, which had to do with the, uh, the supposed three hobos at the uh, Triple Underpass. We actually met in August of 1990. We found out the three things we had in common were the Kennedy assassination, golf, and rock and roll. And what would happen is we would go out on the weekends and we'd play golf. He was a member at a golf course over in Fort Worth. And we'd discuss the Roscoe White story in between shots. <laughs> I remember vividly the first time I met Gary Mack. It was August of 2000. We officed in the basement in those days, and Gary had an office on the far end. You had to walk down this long sort of corridor in the basement to get to his little cubicle. And I remember being taken down there in the anticipation building as I walked down this little stretch uh, to get to meet Gary Mack for the first time. And there he was in the flesh, and I extended my hand and I said, it is an honor to meet you. And he said, Rrr and shook my hand and that was it. That was our first meeting. He had very little time for me at all because I was just one of many young interns coming, uh, coming through the museum at that time. Well, Gary and I met when I was working in Fort Worth and um, there was a position that came open here at the museum and I applied for it and came over and I was interviewed. And um, Gary told me later that he said, I was watching you the whole time, and after you left, I, the first thing I did was go to HR and say, can I date employees here? <laughs> so, When the Sixth Floor exhibit was uh, being developed starting in the late 1970s, Conover Hunt was the project director, and she was looking for a wide variety of individuals who could contribute their knowledge to this very controversial story. Being in charge of the curation was not an easy situation and Gary Mack was involved. He was one of our curators. Gary Mack was one of about 27 individuals that really helped shape the content of the sixth floor. Conover went to Gary specifically because he had uh, vast knowledge of the films and photographs taken in Dealey Plaza at the time of the assassination. And it was a big point of pride for Gary that he was part of that team. And it was really it really brought him full circle when he was able to join the staff here as archivist in the 90s because he had been involved in the 80s about 10 years earlier. After he left KXAS, he came to the sixth floor. And because we were involved in really destroying the Roscoe White story, word got out that I was sent here from Langley, Virginia in order to turn him to anti-conspiracy <laughs> and uh, uh, the reward for my efforts was I got him the job at the sixth floor and you were talking about how every once in a while we get crossways well we'd be sitting having a beer and we'd be arguing over the merits of something or else and I'd say to him you know I got you that job I can call my handlers and <laughs> have you removed. <laughs> I know that this museum meant so much to him and perhaps one of the reasons I have become so passionate and dedicated to this place is because of that passion that Gary felt and because in emulating Gary and looking up to him as a mentor, what he cared about I eventually cared about too. Hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, Sixth Floor Museum on this, our 25th anniversary. When he left Channel 5 and came to work here at the Sixth Floor, I mean, you could have knocked a lot of us over. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, uh, and, and some of his pals, he, oh, he's going to the dark side, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it was a tailor-made job for Gary Mack. It was his life. He was very careful to always guard his role at the Sixth Floor Museum as curator. And I don't think he ever gave me any exclusives or any shortcuts to it, but he trusted me and he trusted my word and I, and I valued that. Gary and I definitely like to think of each other as work brother and sister. In the early days, I was probably pretty shy about 
disagreeing with Gary, but as I got more and more comfortable, not at all. And he certainly, as the opinionated and passionate person that he was, was not shy about uh, expressing his displeasure or disagreement with something. So that led to us uh, bickering like siblings. <laughs> I remember when they were doing the renovation projects, uh, the, the first phase originally and then the phase right before the 50th anniversary and we would go out there and inevitably I would be the photographer with the digital camera and Gary would point at stuff. And there was one picture in particular where we're standing on the north side of Elm Street and Gary is smiling at me and he's pointing at something on the ground and his shadow is casting it. And it was such a great picture that for a couple of years in a row, I sent that around to our department and said, Happy Groundhog's Day. Because it was like Gary was pointing to his shadow that he would see on Groundhog's Day. And, uh, and Gary found that amusing, at least the first time. Behind every great man, there is a great woman. And, and Gary was great in so many ways. And um, when he left work, he went home to an incredibly special woman who helped ground him. At home, he would rarely talk about it. Uh, he needed a break and so we enjoyed watching old black and white movies from the 20s, 30s, 40s and that was our routine. We'd come home and, and sit in the den and we had our own favorite chairs and that was our outlet. We just enjoyed being together. He was a good friend and uh, we just liked each other besides loving each other. When he would come home, we would have the dinner and the movie, but then he would go into the man cave and again would be searching JFK news groups. He was always just passionate about it and it was his life. In the days following Gary's passing last month, there were a lot of folks on there saying, God, he was just answering a question for me a few days ago and or he said he was gonna look into this and get back to me. And you know, he was doing that while just in those last days, answering those questions and making sure he could help with information until the very last. Yes, there are a lot of conspiracy theories out there, but he still wanted to hear those because you never know if a particular idea or thought or... He was so very much into not, not just believing what he believed, but what other people thought. Um, people whose ideas he thought maybe a little radical, he still wanted to listen to it. And his passion was finding the truth. How many think Lee Harvey Oswald did it all by himself? It's okay, it's okay to <laughs> say what you think. And how many folks think there was more to it than Lee Harvey Oswald? All right. I want to say this about Gary. I have never, I don't think I will ever meet anyone in this work that I do that was more incredible in terms of fact-checking, getting the information correct. I'm just so sad to lose him, because he was a friend and he was a, such a tremendous asset to this organization. He was a walking, talking encyclopedia about the, the Kennedy assassination. That was his life. Uh, that, was, that was Gary Maddox's life. He always had an open mind and he was always looking for more information. He was always looking for that extra piece of the puzzle. Gary wouldn't shoot down anything. He would entertain it and then try to knock it down. Or if he couldn't knock it down, you got something there. I worked on a documentary for the 50th anniversary. And uh, I mean, not only did Gary give me everything I asked for and permission for everything I asked for, but he even said, here's something new we got that, that uh, no one has seen. You might be interested in this. Uh, so he, he was uh, helpful and, and just always pursuing every lead. The first documentary that we did, JFK the Dallas Tapes, as reported when it happened, did, did win an Emmy, and, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. I, I, I love that piece. I worked with them very closely when producing a, a series that aired on both WBAP and KLIF uh, news radio stations, uh, the, the, our JFK 50 series, uh, that I'm uh, proud to say went on to win an Edward R. Murrow Award. And of course, Gary, along with several other people, were uh, very important part of that series. I always tell people I, I'm really not a JFK expert. I just play one on TV. Gary was the expert. And then he would always add, too, that he's the guy that taught Rich Ray how to spell JFK. 
One of our ongoing projects here at the museum is, of course, our, our dynamic and ongoing oral history project where we seek interviews with people from around the world about their memories of the assassination. Uh, Gary participated in a few of these, particularly if it was a key eyewitness or someone that he knew personally. I know one of the first ones he did um, was the uh, uh, Towner family, Jim, Pat, and Tina Towner, and Gary was part of that oral history recording in 1996. My name is Gary Mack. Could the three of you give us an idea of how long the shooting lasted? Could you decide, I mean, could you, could you make a sound and kind of maybe come to some kind of agreement about how fast or slow the shots were and were, were some of the shots closer together than the other shots? The Towner family, they were eyewitnesses on the corner of Elm and Houston Street, uh, to the eyewitnesses to the assassination, and both Tina as a 12-year-old and her father had cameras. And G Gary had cultivated a long relationship with the Towner family. Gary was instrumental in establishing these very personal relationships where um, a long history of trust was um, built. And without him, we wouldn't have the collections that we have today. The Towner collection had been in the care of the museum for, an, a, gosh, since 1995 or six and uh, the cameras were on display upstairs. It took me a while to realize how long it took to build those relationships, and sometimes he was um, tight-lipped about those relationships. Um, but in the end, the um, donors always came through. Just earlier this year, in the first part of 2015, uh, Tina did officially donate everything. Uh, Gary shepherded that through. It was very important to him. He had had a long-standing friendship with Tina. Um, we were all very glad to see that happen, and I think Tina was especially as well. Okay, testing level, level, level. <clears throat> <clears throat> Remembering Officer J.D. Tippett, moderated... Oh, boy. Remembering Officer J.D. Tippett. How we doing there, boss? All right. I can't read the words. I guess I'll have to cancel. I remember him being very supportive of getting uh, the, the Tippett family, and I know that as I'm speaking for the Tippett family, they, they always appreciate Gary's uh, passion. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Hugh Ainsworth, and our guests, the Tippett family, Marie, Brenda, and Curtis. That was a heartfelt introduction, and I know as, as we all do, uh, we keep Mrs. Tippett near and dear to our heart as we do all the people that lost, as we do Mrs. Kennedy who lost her husband that day. And Dear Gary's passion showed that night and I said I was glad to have been there and helped been part of that. Another interview that I remember Gary uh, being involved in was, uh, was an eyewitness who remembered seeing the motorcade as it emerged from the triple underpass. And I remember this one vividly because Gary became fixated with this man's story. His name was James Owen. And after the oral history, we actually walked out to Dealey Plaza with Mr. Owen because Gary was adamant about pinpointing the exact spot where he was standing when he saw the motorcade come out from under the triple underpass. This is where you were standing. I would have searched it in. At one trick, I would have done You focus. You focus. I had it. It's not matter what they bought for, they quit. Yeah, you weren't paying attention to the others. You were staring at the Kennedy's car. I think the story I will always remember is from just a couple of years ago when we were covering the 50th anniversary. And Gary took me down into the basement of our old building in East Fort Worth down into the bowels of Channel 5. Down a steep flight of stairs and a dim concrete corridor is a door that leads deep into the past. And so here it is, room number eight. Yeah. After you, sir. We opened up this creaky door and went into this musty storage room and Gary showed me where the original film was from that day. And I felt like he was sharing the map to the buried treasure. <laughs> and I will never forget that. Most TV stations across the country threw out all their old news film. Channel 5 saved it all. Once he convinced and once the museum convinced the TV stations in town to turn over that, that becomes a resource that for generations will, will always be here. And that really is 
that's a, a big part of his legacy. I actually saw Gary get excited a lot um, because because he and I would get excited about the same weird little things. When, for example, we found out that a French reporter, Francois Pelou, who had covered the assassination, was going to be coming to Dallas, uh, we both got really excited. No one else in the office had ever heard of Francois Pelou, but he appears in so many of the films and photographs at Dallas Police Headquarters that weekend that it was like a rock star coming to the Sixth Floor Museum. And Gary and I, we were there, we did the oral history, we took him to Sonny Bryan's for barbecue, and uh, there's a great picture that I really like, and we're walking back from Sonny Bryan's, and it's me and Gary and, and Francois Pelou. And Gary has just made some crack about me being a whippersnapper who wasn't even alive when Kennedy was shot. And I fired back something and I called him Grandpa. And there's an expression on his face, which I'm so glad it was captured in a photograph because it was the sort of like funny irked face he would make when I would say something that he probably should have gotten upset about, but he didn't get upset about, maybe because it was me who said it, but it's just one of those moments frozen in time. The other picture, probably the, the picture that means the most to me, was a moment that was snapped at 12.30 p.m. on November 22, 2003, the 40th anniversary of the assassination. There's this moment of silence in Dealey Plaza, and I'm standing there next to the um, uh, United Nations Ambassador William Vanden Heuvel, who was here as our guest for a program. And unbeknownst to me, when this picture was taken, Gary is standing directly behind me, and in this photograph, his arm is raised, he's in the middle of a thought, and he's explaining some aspect of some theory to somebody, and it's just a perfect moment because here we are in the midst of this moment of silence and I am thinking about the Kennedy assassination. And Gary's talking about Badge Man or some, the single bullet theory or something right behind me. I know Gary was difficult to work with. And I don't see that as a negative. Uh, he was protective of his archive. He wanted it done the right way. He built it from scratch. Uh, he wanted to maintain an archive that would outlive him, and it has. Um, and, and at times, that made him maybe an abrasive person to, to some other people. And I think that's part of his integrity that uh, is now part of our history. The other thing I remember, which I thought was kind of funny, is he looked at me and he said, Dave, Karen says we're famous. Are we famous? And I said, Gary, you're famous. I'm not famous. I can't believe he's gone. Uh, while we had animated conversations, I will miss in part his direction and his viewpoints, which always helped inform the final decision that we were making on any particular issue, whether it was with the press, a particular aspect of an item perhaps coming up for auction, um, the statements that the museum was going to say publicly about our interest in anything. Um, so I, I'm going to miss that. Mentors and friends, there's never enough time. There's never enough time with these folks that mean this much to you. But, looking back on it, minute for minute, hour for hour, I spent more time with Gary Mack in 15 years than I did my own family. And I am eternally grateful for every silly, poignant, dramatic, politically incorrect moment that we shared together. And he has left me a richer and vastly amplified individual. And that means so much to me. It seems funny to say that I already miss it. Is that? Uh, God, it seems really silly to say this, but the the constant emails uh, with notifying me to what he thought might be a copyright infringement or correcting me on something. Um, I already miss that. I keep expecting to see those and. It's a, sim a funny thing to miss, but it, 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 that's, that's, a, that's one of the things I'm going to miss. He was irreplaceable. He was just a truly unique individual, a mystery in many ways, frustrating and lovable at the same time. Karen called me that morning 
and said, it's, uh, this is the call you don't want to get. And um, I, I had trouble. I had about three days of trouble after that because we were so tight. All he would talk about toward the end was, I, I really don't want this story to ever go away. He said, I want, we need to find out the truth. And I, he said, I, I hate that I'm not going to be here to help find that. And so it was more his passion if he wants the museum to just be so, so wonderful as it is now, the way it's in context now. Um, but to never stop asking questions, to never give up um, asking for donations, root around in the dresser drawer, he would always say, and pull out a film, and all of a sudden there it is. And uh, now he, uh, it wasn't so much that, it was the museum. He really wants to, he said, I want the museum to have a wonderful program for the next 50 years. And that's what he wanted to call the program. This was the day before he died, and he was talking about the museum. You know, we should have a program that says the next 50 years, and we should have so and so and so and so on it. And here he is laying there, and it was really literally less than 24 hours before he passed away. But this, it was his love. And, uh, and thinking of these things, and being the producer person that he was, you know, this gave him a great sense of relief, a great sense of that he still mattered. At least 500 years from now, people will at least be able to see the films and photographs. They'll still be around, or the latest digitized version of them will, will still be around. That makes me feel good. <laughs>